Okay, so today I'm going to talk to you about something that's a little bit different than what I usually do. Um, it's got a little bit of science in it, but really I'm going to be talking about worldviews. And this is a word that I've started using a lot more. I really like this word because it's highly descriptive of something that is, uh, you know, everybody's got a worldview. And so it's a comprehensive idea of the world. It's how you see it. Now, we are Christians. We believe in Christian doctrine and theology. But a worldview is more encompassing than that. Um, it's a broad perspective of life in the universe that includes attitudes that come out of your theology or your philosophy. It's, it's your morality, your ethics, the things that you value. Okay? And so we talk about things like the Christian worldview or the atheist worldview, a naturalistic one, or worldviews of other faith traditions. Okay, now uh, this is important because we're having to engage more and more with people and in terms of what their worldviews are. And I have a challenge for you that I'm going to spell out uh, by the end of this talk. So first, just a little bit of why I'm Christian. I think most of you have either heard or read my testimony and know that I was raised atheist by non-believing parents in a secular country. Uh, but when I, I came back to the United States, I actually am originally from Oregon. My parents moved us up to, Oregon, or to Canada when I was just a little kid and uh, because they were socialist atheists and they wanted to experience that somewhere else um, in British Columbia. But I always knew that I would come back to the United States. This is where I'm from. Came back to go to university. And so I'm in my early 20s, and I start thinking about, well, what's my worldview? You know, what, what, what are my set of values? What do I believe in? And I knew that I believed in things like uh, the inherent worth of every person, the sanctity of life. I believed in individual rights. I believed in things like freedom. You know, all, this, all these things that I just believed in. I didn't really know where this came from. And so I thought, well, I'd better construct something and figure out what the basis of all of my beliefs are. And when I started to do this, and I knew that I had to do it from a naturalistic perspective because I wasn't a believer. So I thought, okay, I'll just start from the brute facts of the universe, and then I'll arrive at all of these things that way. But I couldn't. There was no way to get to these things. You know, how do you get individual rights just from a very naturalistic view of the universe. The universe doesn't care. I mean, there's, there's nothing written in the stars that says that everybody matters. And so this, this really bothered me. You know, it, it, it was the first big crack in my naturalistic foundation. And I just thought, well, this, this is really kind of disturbing that I can't figure out how to support all of these things that I believe in, my worldview, just based on the facts of the universe. So this was kind of the beginning of the unraveling of my atheism. And then uh, it was just a couple of years after that that I had a Romans 120 moment. We all know Romans 120. It's one of my favorite passages in the Bible. And basically saying, OK, so even if you've never had anybody talk to you about God, the evidence for God is all around you. It's in his handiwork. It's, it's just out there. You know, we really are without excuse because we have this thing called general revelation. And this is how I came to believe in God. I didn't open the Bible in my entire life. I've never read a word of scripture, never set foot in a church. And yet when I was at UC San Diego doing uh, cutting edge cosmology research, just the work that I was doing convinced me that there must be some kind of supreme intelligence behind it all. And so. I became a believer on the spot quite unexpectedly. And then it was a few years later when I was exposed to arguments for the validity of scripture of the Bible that I gradually became Christian and was baptized. But it wouldn't have happened, or at least not that way, unless my atheistic, naturalistic worldview had taken that initial hit. Okay, so now since then, when I became Christian halfway through my PhD here at UT, I became very interested in apologetics. I was all fired up because I came to Christian faith through science. And I was really shocked to discover there were a lot of Christians who were skeptical of science because they thought that science was in opposition to their beliefs. And so I was all fired up 
to get into apologetics, to try to convince Christians, look, you don't need to fear science. Science is on your side. And so I got into this and I got connected with uh, RTB and some other groups. And so we spend a lot of time getting invested in building up arguments for God and for the Bible and defending them. And that's good. We should be doing that. But it occurred to me after doing this for years that we Christians, especially those of us in apologetics, spend a lot of time on the defensive. You know, in boxing terms, we're kind of up against the rope sometimes, and we're just taking all these blows. And, you know, I, I thought something about this doesn't quite seem right. Now, we have a lot of arguments and evidence in favor of the Christian worldview. Uh, so this, you know, this is just a partial list. We have all of these arguments like the cosmological, the fine-tuning, um, the teleological, which was kind of where, that's where I came from, ontological, the resurrection of Jesus Christ as a historical event. Where do we get justice and morality? And then I'm really getting into um, the out-of-body experiences, near-death experiences, which is what uh, David was talking about with his event. These are legitimate, documented medical phenomena that you really can't explain any way other than to show that the mind and the body are separate entities. And this is supportive of Christianity. And then also personal experiences. You know, you can't discount personal experiences with the divine that people have had. So all of these things are highly supportive of Christian belief, belief in God, especially when taken together. Okay, so we present these arguments, we defend them, but then the problem is, and I'm sure some of you have encountered this when you talk to non-believing family members and friends, how resistant they are nevertheless to these very compelling arguments. And so we'll take, for instance, the Kalam cosmological argument. This is one of my favorites. Uh, this was popularized by the Christian philosopher, uh, William Lane Craig, who I'm just a huge fan. I really like him. And so he, he, he kind of uh, popularized this in the 1970s. It was, it was a very old argument. That which begins to exist has a cause. This is the first premise. The universe began to exist, therefore, the universe has a cause. Now, this isn't a direct argument for God, but when you couple it with an argument for why that cause has to be personal, that's what makes the most sense, then it becomes a powerful argument for God. Now, so you present this argument to non-believers to try to get them on board. Okay, let's, let's open up the possibility um, of God as the creative force behind the universe. Now, they can't attack the logic You've got these first two premises, and then you've got the third, which is the logical conclusion. The logic is flawless, so nobody ever attacks that. But what they do instead is that they go after one of the two first premises. And so I don't know if any of you have ever encountered this, because I've used this argument, and so I have people saying, well, you know, maybe not everything needs a cause, and they'll, they'll try to invoke quantum mechanics and say, well, there are uncaused events in quantum mechanics. That's actually not true. That's, that's a misuse of quantum mechanics. That's not how it works. But that's, that's one thing they'll try to do to get around that. Or they'll say, well, okay, premise number two, uh, and I think this is something that uh, Dr. Zwerink is going to address, is maybe the universe just popped into existence. Oh, no, that's the first one. Um, that maybe the universe was in some kind of eternal quantum state before, you know, the Big Bang. Maybe somehow there wasn't a beginning, or you have things like the hawking hartle model, which, you know, you've got things like, you know, the arrow of time flipping around, and, and you get all these non-believers trying to kind of get out of a beginning by invoking these, to me, what are not very compelling arguments. But the point here is they really don't like the implications of these arguments, and so they try to attack the premises. And even though, in my opinion, these attacks are very weak, this is how they keep from ever having to deal with the conclusion. They'll just keep dancing around with those first premises. They'll keep nitpicking and just, well, I, I'm sorry, I'm just not convinced. That's what they'll say. Okay, so we'll spend a lot of time doing this. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't. We should keep building these arguments and putting them out there and defending them, but I think we also need to turn things around and go on the offensive and start 
you know, in boxing terms, landing some, some hits of our own. All right, and the way we do this is by going after their worldview. And I thought about this, you know, I'm on social media all the time. I'm on Twitter, I'm dealing with people. And, and I thought, you know, why am I always the one defending my worldview? How about you guys tell me all about your worldview and where it comes from and you defend it. You convince me that your worldview is at least as good as mine, if not superior. And it's really funny to watch people kind of get taken aback by that because like, you're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to defend yours. And the, the reason I got to this point is because I remembered my experience as a student being very disturbed that I could not figure out how I got to my atheistic, naturalistic worldview. So I kind of liken this to a brick wall. So when you're encountering, encountering non-believers and they've got that, you know, that, that edifice up there, the resistance, like this, this is my worldview, you're not going to knock it down and get through with the gospel, right? Well, you're probably not with a lot of these people. They just, they put up that brick wall, it's solid, you're not going to be able to, to break through with what you really want them to get to. But if you can introduce a crack, and this is what happened to me in my 20s as a student. You know, I didn't become a theist on the spot when I realized that I didn't understand my own philosophy of life. I just kind of went, ugh. And then it just bothered me for years. You know, it just kind of was there in the background. And then by the time I was starting to see evidence for God, that wall came down because it already had cracks in it. There were fissures in there. It's a lot easier to bust through that with the message of the gospel once you introduce the crack. And so that's all your goal is. I'm going to show you how to do this with your non-believing friends and family. I'll show you how to do this, but all your, your whole goal here is just to introduce a crack in that wall. Or as a colleague of mine said, just the pebble in the shoe that's just going to, just going to bother them, right? Now, I think this also would work for people of other faith traditions, if you're wanting to talk to Buddhists or Muslims or people of other faith, I'm, I think this would work just as well, but I've tailored this talk mostly towards naturalistic, you know, non-believing type worldviews. Okay, so now, part of the reason for this is because we invest so much time and energy in doing what we do. I spend most of my working time doing this kind of stuff and it's so easy for a skeptic to just say, nah, you haven't convinced me, I'm sorry. Well, now when you get them to try to defend and describe their worldview, now they're invested in it. They've got what's called skin in the game. They're not so easily gonna be flippant and, and dismissive. You want them to get invested, and it's always funny on social media when I'm on Twitter, and they'll ask me questions. I'll get atheists asking me questions, and I can usually tell the ones who are probably going to waste my time. And so I say, yes, I will answer your question, but you have to do a little homework for me first. I want you to look up, and I'll ask them to look something up. I want you to summarize you know, this argument. I want you to summarize the evidence for this. They get really offended, some of them. They're just like, how dare you? you know? And some of them will play along with it, which is great, because then we can have a fruitful discussion. But the ones who get offended, like, oh, how dare you ask me to do anything? And then they just go away. And it's kind of a nice way to make the time wasters go away. But hopefully, you get people who want to engage and you can get them involved in this exercise. Okay, so these were the questions I asked myself as a young atheist about my worldview. Where did it come from? You know, what assumptions was it based on? Because every worldview is going to be uh, based on at least a few assumptions. These are things you believe to be true even though you can't prove them. Did my worldview explain everything? You know, everything from existence, from the fine-tuning of the universe, consciousness, values. Um, does it hold together? You know, is it going to fall apart under the weight of its own contradictions? You know, is it coherent? Does it agree with itself? You know, these were the questions that I asked. And these are the questions that you should be asking non-believers. Okay, and what I found um, after examining my own worldview and talking to countless non-believers about this is that most naturalistic worldviews are just a mishmash. They're just sort of this pastiche of cultural things they were raised with. And you can see the elements of the Christianity, of the cultural Christianity 
that most people in the West were raised with. Like, they'll agree that it's, you shouldn't murder people, that you shouldn't steal from them, you shouldn't lie, you should try to be honest in your dealings, you know, things like that. Um, you know, and a lot of this came from the Christian culture in which they were raised, even if they were raised in a place like where I was in Canada, which was post-Christian by that time. There's also a lot of stuff that they just absorbed in school or from the popular media. And then it's just sprinkled with personal preferences. Well, you know, I really like, you know, my thing is I, I really like food, so, you know, I think it's okay to overindulge in food, this kind of thing. They'll, they'll just they'll tack on whatever it is that they personally like. Okay, so now you understand, like, th th this is not going to be a coherent, solid thing. But before you can engage in this exercise, you really first have to understand your own worldview because this is going to be the objective standard by which we measure other things. And so I call this the mere Christian worldview. Um, it's inspired by C.S. Lewis, this is just the utterly distilled essence of Christianity, okay? So there's a lot more to it, obviously, and there are some finer points on which different denominations disagree, but boy, they'd better agree on all of this. So we believe in a transcendent, eternal, all-powerful, loving God who created the universe, who created life, who created specifically human life. We experienced the fall, okay, this is a big deal, because this is why we needed the redemption through the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So this is bare bones Christianity. And by the way, I can put all of this up on, I have a, an account on SlideShare, I can put this up there. So if anybody doesn't wanna have to scramble to take notes, I usually put most of my presentations on there. Okay, so I think we can all agree that this is very basic Christianity. Now, here's the advantage of the Christian worldview based on those core principles. It's based on the real world. Now when I say this, sometimes I get non-believers scoffing, you know, haha, you believe in the magical sky fairy, you know, how can it be based on the real world? It's not what I'm talking about. If you take, for instance, the Buddhist worldview, a lot of people are shocked because they haven't done any comparative religion study to find out that Buddhism in general regards experiences, what we sense of the world, it's based on illusion, okay? There isn't really that real world in uh, the Buddhist religion. Or you get postmodernism, where everybody kind of creates their own reality. You know, that is not a given, that, that somebody is going to assume that the real objective world exists. But Christianity says it does. We live in the real world, this is all real, it's objective, we can know it, we can experience it. Christianity accepts that as true. Now, it also explains several phenomena. Why is there anything at all? Why is there existence? Why does the universe look so designed? Why is it finely tuned? It explains, you know, life, consciousness, all of these very difficult problems. It solves multiple problems, like how do you arrive at morality? How do you arrive at a set of rules for how we should live? Why we should value human life? why we should love our enemies, why we should love our neighbor as ourselves, things like that. It addresses longings, okay? You know, most of us, I would say the vast majority of us, have this sense of we need meaning in our lives. You know, we can't just get through life just thinking, well, my meaning in life is just to get up and, and to just do the same thing every day. But we've got to have this view of just like, what's it all about, right? And most of us have lost loved ones, friends, family members. We have this longing, you know, to be reconnected with them eventually, to know that life continues. And, uh, you know, I just, I personally don't understand how anybody gets through this life thinking like this is it. It provides comfort. And I think this especially on the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks, I mean, we live in this world. This is sometimes a really awful place. You know, it, sometimes it's a great place, but there's heartache, there's horror. You know, my husband is a combat veteran. He's been to war. He has seen the absolute worst of humanity. And it was after that that he became Christian. He also was raised atheist. You need that comfort. 
you need some sense that there is recompense for all of this heartache, for all of this, this horror that we experience, that we see in the world. It's coherent. The Christian worldview really holds together. There aren't parts of the Christian faith where we say, well, this explains this, that contradicts with explanations for other things. It's very cohesive, it holds together. And it's highly motivating. Now, I mean in the sense of modifying people's behavior. So my parents worked with severe behavior problem children in the public school system. And they can tell you that one of the most difficult things that you can do is to motivate someone to make changes in their life, behavior changes. It's really hard to do. Christianity is highly motivating in terms of, you, you see all these people who said, well, you know, I found faith and I turned my life around. People like Chuck Colson with his prison ministry, uh, people who've been drug addicts, who just, you know, the worst places in their life. Alcoholics Anonymous, all of these, you know, uh, like addiction ministries, higher power. It's just, we don't find that motivation within ourselves. We find it outside of ourselves, above ourselves. And Christianity is highly motivating in terms of uh, motivating changes for the better. Okay, so here's, here's the worldview challenge in a nutshell. So when you're talking to a non-believer, challenge them to present their worldview. And, and you do this with kindness, with gentleness, with sincerity, like, you know, you know ha ha, let's get them. But just, you know, to really engage these people as human beings and to say, I'm, I'm really curious about what your worldview is. How do you see things? What, what, what you know, form, what informs your attitudes about life, your philosophy? Ask them what their core beliefs are. Ask them what assumptions that's based on. What grounds those beliefs? You know, because you can't just sort of pick them out of the air. You have to say, well, it's based on, you know, whatever it is. Ask them how their worldview explains all of these things. So, you know, Christianity can explain all of these things. The fine tuning of the universe, the design, the order, the intelligibility of the universe, that the universe was created. Why does anything exist? Can we believe in reality as opposed to all of this is just an illusion? What accounts for the creation of life? That's one of the big mysteries. Where did life come from? Consciousness, that's another one. Nobody can explain it. Nobody knows. Nobody can explain how you can get a chance arrangement of molecules and get consciousness. How about rationality? You know, that we can trust our ability to logically work through things. Out-of-body experiences, near-death experiences, where does morality and justice come from? And then Jesus Christ, you know, and I think we ought, to, we ought to bring that up more often, just as a historical fact. Jesus Christ, there's no doubt from a historical perspective that he existed. And if you read books like Lee Strobel's The Case for Christ, or Jim Wallace's books like uh, Cold Case Christianity, there is a very strong case to be made that the, the gospels are true. I mean, people have to deal with this as a legitimate historical thing that happened. How does your worldview explain that? That's gonna be very difficult. Okay, so their worldview has to explain all of these things. And it has to kind of organically arise from that worldview and it all has to stick together. You're gonna to see later on that that's very hard to do. And then ask them, does your worldview offer comfort and consolation? Does it motivate you to be a better person, to live better? Well, you know, and, and that's a legitimate question. I think people are gonna have a hard time with this. Um, and I think in terms of this, this person right here, this is Hugh Everett III, who's a tragic and fascinating figure in the history of science. So he was a quantum physicist who came up with what's called the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. Now, quantum mechanics, as you know, is kind of weird. So mathematically, it is very well tested, okay? There's no doubt that quantum mechanics describes aspects of the real world very well. But in terms of philosophically, like, how do you interpret this? How do you make sense of quantum mechanics? Nobody really knows. You have what are called different interpretations, like the Copenhagen interpretation, which for a long time was what prevailed, and it was this idea that you, know, you have a quantum system and it's got a wave function, you don't really know what state the system is until you observe it, 
and then it collapses into something that is definite. Okay, that's kind of weird because it, it sort of implies that you know, consciousness somehow determines what's going to happen in reality. But he said instead, well, okay, let's say that you have some kind of a quantum system and it can either go this direction or in that direction. Well, instead of collapsing it just down to one, and then the other state just kind of disappears, what happens is he says, well, maybe the universe splits and both things actually happen, state A and state B. And the universe just keeps splitting and splitting and splitting, and so you get a multiverse this way where every possibility is realized. Okay, now, Mathematically, you know, it's not completely crazy to suggest something like that, although by what mechanism a universe splits, I have no idea. But there is no doubt that this was motivated by his atheistic beliefs. He was an atheist, non-believer, and like any of us would be disturbed by the idea that someday the universe is just gonna snuff you out. I mean, who, I don't, is anybody okay with that idea? I just, it's so weird to me, but he, found sort of this comfort in this naturalistic immortality through the many worlds interpretation. And it's like, well, okay, so I'm at a cross section, a crosswalk. I can either cross the street or I can stay on this side of the sidewalk. The universe splits in two. You know, in one universe, I stay here. In another universe, I cross the street and I get smashed by a cement truck and that's the end. Well, you know, in his mind, a copy of himself survives in this other universe and therefore he doesn't really die. I mean, it's so strange because, I mean, I don't even know how you define yourself in terms of like if there's an infinite number of copies of you and you're not having the same experiences that they are. But in his mind, this was a form of immortality. Now, okay, so he believes he's immortal through this, this quantum mechanism. Did it inspire him to live his best possible life? Well, no. Uh, you know, he ate, drank, and smoked himself to death in his early 50s, leaving behind a wife and two emotionally scarred children. And he left instructions to his wife that when he dies, to just have him cremated and, and just dump his ashes in the trash, and, which is what she did. And just, I, the worst part of this is that his daughter later committed suicide and said in her note, just throw my ashes in the trash, maybe I'll end up in the same universe as my daddy. And it just... It just kills me, you know, I have a daughter, just the thought of that, I mean, this is the legacy of this worldview. So tragic and just, you know, every time I think about it, it's just, it's just so emotionally compelling. Like, this is the most drab, bleak worldview that I could possibly think of. Now, this is not to say that no atheist can live a good life. I do know atheists who live good life. My dad, who about four years ago became Christian, was an atheist for most of his life. and was a very caring person who helped a lot of people. So I'm not saying it's impossible to be a good person who's motivated to do good things if you're an atheist. But the problem is that the way that this sort of thing gets internalized, I just, I don't see it as being a source of motivation at all to live a good life. Now, on the other hand, you look at how Christianity motivates people to do extraordinary things. So here's John Newton, okay? He uh, was a former slaver. He was, uh, as a young man, was pressed into service. They had these things called press gangs in uh, Great Britain where you would literally get forced into serving in the Navy. And so he was serving aboard these slave ships and he uh, you know, was just living kind of this terrible life, uh, this, this sort of rowdy, debauched life. And he at some point rediscovered the faith that he had been raised with as a very young boy. I think his mother died when he was uh, seven years old. But the first seven years of his life, he had been raised with very strong faith and later rediscovered that and quit the slave trade, became a pastor, and then of course, he is famous for having written the song, the hymn, Amazing Grace, which everybody pretty much in the world knows. Um, and I was reading about the history of this song and Chuck Colson with his prison ministry said that every prison that he went to, whether it was men or women, every inmate there knew this song. This was the one song that they all knew the words to. It's just powerful, right? And it was about his personal journey from this wretched person 
to being saved. You know, this is a big deal. Or one of my favorite figures, William Wilberforce, and uh, the story of his life is in a movie called Amazing Grace, which I encourage you to watch. And so he grew up, I don't think with very strong faith or any faith at all, he grew up wealthy and idle, he had whatever he wanted. He went into politics just kind of for the fun of it and the glory of it. And when he started to examine his life, he actually went through a, a period of deep sorrow, realizing that it was sort of pointless. And he had this spiritual transformation, became Christian, and at that point was like, okay, I need a cause. And he took up the cause of abolition. And this was a big deal back then. We're talking about 18th century Great Britain because their economy was so tied up in the slave trade that it was thought to be impossible for them to extricate themselves from that. Okay, and he's looking at this and saying, this is monstrous. You know, as a Christian, every human has value. We're all made in the image of God. How can we possibly engage in this sort of thing as a Christian nation? And so for 25 years, he fought in parliament for abolition and was finally successful in convincing the government to use the power of the Royal Navy to put an end to the massive slave trade. And then he became a philanthropist and he had dozens of causes. This is how motivating the Christian faith can be. You know, whether it's just to clean up our own lives or to take up these incredible causes, it's motivating when you think about this all-powerful God in whose image we are all made and we're commanded to love God and to love each other, how can that not be motivating? Okay, now I'm gonna throw a little bit of Star Trek in here because I'm a big Trekkie, and I don't know if some of you out there, I hope you are, always gotta put some Star Trek in here. And so, um, you know, I, I watch a lot of stuff on YouTube, um, and there's a channel that I like that, where it's just a bunch of geeky guys talking about science fiction stuff, and one of them is really into Star Trek, especially the next generation, and so I was watching one of, their, uh, one of their episodes where they're reviewing their favorite and least favorite episodes of TNG. And this guy, Mike, who's one of the hosts, um, I don't get the sense that he is at all a religious guy. But when he was asked what was his least favorite episode, he brought up this one called Parallels. And so those of you who are familiar with the show, this is Lieutenant Worf. So this is years after the original series when uh, you know, the Federation has become friends with the Klingons, and so he's the Klingon officer on the Enterprise. And we all love him because he's brave and he's strong and he's really competent. And so in this episode, he's in a shuttlecraft and he's coming back from this kind of big martial arts competition and because he's our wharf. He came in first place you know, with honor and all this, and he's, he's recording a log about how he did so well and he's coming back. And at some point he hits like this quantum rift and it opens up this thing where somehow he starts shifting through all the different universes in this, in, and here's where Star Trek kind of acknowledges that they follow the many worlds interpretation. And so we encounter all these different wharfs where some of them didn't do so well in this competition. It's like, oh, well, I came in third place or I came in ninth place or, you know, progressively worse. And, so at some point you end up in the shuttlecraft with all of these different wharfs and it's chaos and they're trying to figure out how to restore order to all of this. Now the reason that Mike, this host of this show, hated this episode is he said it robs Worf of his uniqueness. Like why do we even care about these stories, about what happens to these characters if there's an infinite number of them and if anything that can happen does happen? We're just happening to watch one version of what happens to him. And it's just, he just said he just absolutely hates this concept of multiple worlds and infinite numbers of these characters because it just robs it of all meaning. I think that's something that we all value about ourselves and each other is our utter uniqueness. There's only one of us. We only have one set of experiences and there's a lot at stake, right? It matters, there's a timeline. There's one story of the world, we're all playing a part in it, and that's it. And I th it's just this thing that even to non-religious people, the idea is kind of offensive and it, and it robs life of its flavor. Okay, so let's talk about the naturalistic worldview again. So we have 
two things usually in terms of scientific apologetics, two things that I encounter as objections to God. So one would be, well, the multiverse just explains everything. And it kind of does. You know, it explains away the Big Bang, design, fine tuning, explains some things. Or you can just accept the idea that there's no cause for the universe, and if there's no cause, you don't need a causer, and it kind of just pushes God out of the picture. Okay, so if you're an atheist, you can rely on these things to kind of explain some things away, but it comes at a pretty steep cost. Okay, if you accept the idea of the multiverse, the naturalistic multiverse, say goodbye to uniqueness, there's no such thing as choice because everything that can happen does happen. Like, you're presented with a, you know, an option. Do you lie and cheat somebody or do you not? Do you deal with them honestly? Well, in this universe, you think you're a good guy because you didn't lie and cheat, but guess what? In another universe, you did. You're a complete jerk, right? There's no choice. Um, and in, in that sense, there's no love, there's no justice, there's no morality, there's no meaning, there's no reason. You can't even trust your own senses. There's no reason, you know, C.S. Lewis describes this, and he said, if it's a naturalistic universe, anything that can happen will happen. You don't know if you were just brought into a universe that was created five seconds ago, complete with false memories, and you're hallucinating all of this. Like C.S. Lewis says, how can you trust your own senses? You know, you, you don't know that just the chance arrangement of the molecules in your brain are giving you any kind of an accurate picture of what's happening. Now, if there's no causes, well, say goodbye to science. I mean, science is kind of constructed on causes, the idea of things causing other things to happen. Again, reason, senses, all gone. Okay, so here's the many worlds. This is a, a nice little, um, cartoon of how many worlds work. So you've got a scenario where a man is expressing his love for a woman and in one universe she says yes and they get married and then maybe they have a child in a, one of those universes and you can see how it keeps splitting into different options in another universe she says no and then it splits off and then he finds someone else and she says yes or she says no and it's just on and on and on and on. There's no meaning to any of this, right? Anything that can happen will happen. You didn't choose any of this. It's just stuff that happens. Okay, but nobody actually acts like this is true. If you talk to people, okay, do you really believe this? If so, let's say that your grandmother was robbed at gunpoint for her purse, the contents of her purse, would you just say, oh well, you know, the robber didn't choose to do that. This is just the universe where this happened to happen. You know, c'est la vie. No. You'd call the police. You'd want the guy you know, brought to justice, right? Nobody actually lives like that's true. And I think that's how you can tell that they don't really believe it. Or what they'll say is, well, you know, we just have to kind of lie to ourselves and just we need to have the illusion of justice and meaning and love and all these things. Really? You know, I think that's kind of crazy because you know, we get accused as Christians of living in sort of this fantasy world where we have to lie to ourselves. Well, I actually don't know any Christians who do that. You know, the ones who really believe, we live it out. I don't have to lie to myself, you know, and, and to have this illusion that there are actions and consequences and decisions and things like that. But I challenge you, when you talk to people who say that they believe in the multiverse, ask them, you know, do you really? If somebody robbed you, if somebody beat up your mother, would you want justice? Would you care? Would it bother you? You know, it shouldn't if you really believe in the multiverse. But nobody, I don't know a single person who lives like this is actually true. Now here's the other problem. You know, you have to give up your idea of objective reality because in a naturalistic worldview, how would you know that what you're experiencing is real? There's actually very little basis for believing that because in the multiverse, anything that can happen does happen, including a universe where you're just a brain in a vat hallucinating that you're an actual real person doing things. Or in terms of uh, just like statistically speaking, in a naturalistic sort of scenario, would you get a universe like this just popping into existence? A highly ordered, structured universe like this Statistically, it's much more likely that what you would get is a space in which a single brain 
just fluctuates into existence quantum mechanically, complete with a set of false memories, hallucinating that it's experiencing you know, this kind of a world. These are called Boltzmann brains. And it's something I encourage you to look into. It's a very interesting phenomenon. William Lane Craig talks about this. It's much more likely that this would happen, just purely in terms of the mathematics of a naturalistic universe. So on what basis, then, would an atheist assume that what he's experiencing is real, when it's much more likely that it's not? So this, to me, is blind faith. You know, you say, well, I choose to believe that what I'm experiencing is real. Well, that's blind faith. You know, you have a world where you, where you have to lie to yourself, that there's choice, that there's love, that there's meaning, that you have to have blind faith that what you're experiencing is real because you don't really have a philosophical foundation for that. So that is the challenge, to have these people explain, OK, what do you believe? What is it based on? How do you reconcile these things? Now, how do you explain all this stuff? And the problem is that explanations for one thing will conflict with the explanations for other things. So if you believe in the multiverse to explain fine tuning, design, the creation of the universe, well, that's going to conflict with rationality, with any sense of morality, of justice. You know, um, can you believe in reality? How do you explain life and consciousness? These things are just kind of magic in this scenario because nobody can really explain how these things arise in a naturalistic worldview. They all just say, well, science has figured out so much already. I believe that science will eventually answer these questions. OK, again, there's that faith. Okay. So in the end, this is the worldview challenge. With kindness and with sincerity, just ask these people about their worldview and ask them to defend it. What are the core beliefs, the assumptions, what grounds the beliefs, how does it explain all these phenomena, what comfort does it offer, how does it motivate you, OK? And I think what's going to happen with a lot of these people, they may not show in the beginning that they're affected by this, but I guarantee you're going to introduce a little crack into that brick wall. You're going to put that little pebble in the shoe that maybe even years from now might lead to them being open to the message of Jesus Christ. Okay? So that is the worldview challenge. I hope that's been helpful, and I think you, just, you need to go on the offensive, have them defend their philosophy. Okay? Thank you very much. Whenever I talk to an atheist, especially someone who's trying to use science and talk about how irrational the Christian worldview is, uh, some of them appeal to the little teapot that's rotating around Saturn. You've probably heard that one. Yeah, okay. the, the, the same kind of belief. Yeah. My jab, if you will, to use your analogy, is to go straight to free will. And I want to know, do you believe you have free will? Because if you, if you believe you have free will, then that's not a naturalistic worldview. And if you don't believe you have free will, then why should I believe anything you think? Because you, everything you think is determined. So in the scientific circle, how often does free will come up when you're talking to other people? And, and how effective of a jab do you think that is for naturalism? That's a pretty good one, actually. Um, in terms of scientific discussions, it doesn't come up a whole lot. Uh, but when you're talking to people in this context of, you know, Christianity or the multiverse or whatever, and yeah, I've, that, I'm glad you brought that up. And I have seen people asking that, well, do you believe in free will? And you will get scientists, atheistic scientists, who say no. But then, you know, as John said, then why should I believe anything you say? You're just, the universe just determined that you were going to just say that or believe whatever you say you believe. You know, and then again, it always comes down to how does a person actually live it out? Do people live like they believe that? Because if they did, they wouldn't get mad about anything. They wouldn't take up causes of justice. They wouldn't, there'd be no such thing as social justice, right? You'd have no basis to be upset that group A is oppressing group B, right? It's just something that happened. Nobody decided it, right? So, so for me, the main thing is to ask people, do you actually live like that is true? Do you live like free will is not a thing? Because if you, you know, you'll see that contradiction. But I, I think just, I think you said it, you know. If they don't believe in free will, then why should I believe you? If you do, 
on what basis do you believe that in a naturalistic universe? It only makes sense in a Christian universe. Yeah. Okay. So, in most seminaries where apologetics is an elective course, and most churches, you can't find anybody who can structure an argument or even define a syllogism. How do you motivate the body of the church to? Uh, oh, thank you. So, how do you motivate the body of the church to learn about? science and argumentation and logic and reason and putting together structured arguments that can oppose a science worldview? That's a great question. So in, in, how do we get churches to want to do apologetics? Uh, and I, I understand that a, there are a lot of churches who are resistant to that. And in fact, um, you know, and back when I was doing um, this apologetics class at Hill Country with a couple of colleagues, with Dennis and with John, and we would go to different churches and ask if they were interested in doing stuff like this with their high school students. And a lot of them said no, kind of shockingly, because they thought that apologetics were a waste of time. And said, well, all you need is the gospel. All you need is the message. Um, we've got vacation Bible school, and we've got um, you know, these youth groups. That's all we need. And I mean, you do need those things, absolutely. But I don't think, especially in this day and age, that's, that's enough. You know, I think they're kind of burying their head in the sand. And so the way that I, I'm trying to remember, it may have been Jim Wallace, I can't remember who it was, somebody who went to one of these churches and said, okay, you know, I'm gonna to pretend to be an atheist and I'm gonna come in and I'm gonna to talk to your students and present some challenges and ask questions and let's see how they respond. And so he came in as kind of an aggressive atheist and, and presenting all of these objections to the Christian faith. You know, it's like, you know, do we really know the historical record? You know, the multiverse accounts for the universe, but all these things, right? And the youth pastor was shocked and really upset to discover that his students couldn't defend any of their beliefs, that they just, they were tongue-tied, they didn't know how to respond. They, some of them couldn't even articulate the basics of their own faith, and at that point, the pastor was convinced, okay, we need to start doing apologetics here. Uh, because really, I mean, if we can't defend our own faith, that's, you know, as a, as a young person, you stand to lose that faith, but, which is tragic, right? But then you also lose the opportunity to have an effective witness for Christ going out there and ministering to other people. So something like that where you say, okay, well, let's see how well equipped our young people are at this church, and even the, the adults, let's see how well equipped they are to stand up to criticism. You know, what if you had a seeker who was asking all sorts of questions, would somebody in your church be able to minister to them? You know, so I think that is an effective way is to show them where the deficiencies are. So that, that would be one way. Yeah. Uh, I, I like the idea of naturalists to explain their own worldview. I, I found many people will retreat into the idea of agnosticism, just saying, hey, I can't know, so Got a I'll, microphone just for you. I'll just be satisfied with uh, not being able to know. Is there any insight you might give us about how to deal with someone retreating into agnosticism? That's how do you deal with somebody who's sort of a disinterested agnostic? That is a tough one. Well, um, they're, they're saying they can't know, therefore oh. they're not going to try to... Uh, they can't know. They're, they're not going to mm -hmm. try to deal with the complexity of their world, of a worldview making okay. sense of reality. That's an interesting perspective. Somebody who just thinks it's too complicated and unanswerable and therefore just doesn't even want to try to engage. That's a tough one. It's really, I would rather deal with an atheist who is angry and all fired up. That's a person I can deal with. Somebody who's just kind of like, we can't know, so I don't care. That's, that's a tough one. Um, you might be able to use an analogy of like, okay, um, a civil case in court. Now, you have different standards for evidence and proof, depending if you're in criminal court or in civil court. Now, in criminal court, 
you have to be able to prove something beyond a shadow of a doubt in order to have a conviction. But in a civil court, it just has to be a preponderance of evidence, meaning do you have 51% of the evidence favoring you know, the, the plaintiff or the defendant, right? And I wonder if you could use something like that and say, well, you know, if you were in a civil court, and let's say it was, you're on the jury, and you're trying to figure out if somebody deserves damages, right? And somebody has wronged somebody else, like a defamation suit or something like that. And it's complicated. You don't have all of the evidence. And I guess you can ask them, would you be able to submit you know, uh, a decision on this, a verdict? Could you do like a preponderance of evidence kind of thing? If you had 51% of the evidence in favor of this uh, verdict versus that one, would you be able to do that and to say, well, could you do that you know, about existence, about life? So maybe if that person said, well, yeah, you know, I could come back with a verdict in that case if most of the evidence was in favor of this, and just say, well, you know, can you do that with your own personal philosophy to say the preponderance of evidence favors this worldview versus this one? Because you know, personally, I don't know how somebody can live not having a, at least some idea of what life is about and what they're supposed to do. But I mean, that's just one idea. You could try that preponderance of evidence thing. Yeah. yeah. And maybe just to add to that, I know Francis Schaefer talked about the idea of no one can live in a state of neutrality. We are always living by one belief or another, even by I don't believe this, that means that you actually, that you're, you're having the opposite belief. And so maybe by that of like, no, you actually, there's really no possibility of being completely apathetic. You have to live by some And they may, be, they may be assuming a worldview without really knowing it. You know, they may think that they're neutral when they're really not. You know, so there, there's that aspect to it, too. Because I don't know anybody who, if they saw some little old lady getting beat up by a thug, would just be like, I'm an agnostic. I don't know if this is right or wrong, so I'm not going to get involved. You know, they wouldn't, right? I think most people would get involved, right? At the very least, to call the police. So, I think there's this implicit assumption of a worldview, even with these agnostics, that they may not even realize that they're making these assumptions. But they're just kind of refusing to own it, or they, or they don't see it because they haven't examined it. So yeah, that, that's a possibility. That's kind of a tough one, though. It's a lot easier to deal with people who are fired up, you know, one way or another. You know, my sister-in-law talked about that. So, my brother's wife, very strong believer. Her parents are both complete non-believers. This is in Canada. And she had, a hard, she had an easier time dealing with my dad, who was a fired up atheist. And she said, I don't know what to do with my parents because they're really just kind of squishy. And they're atheism agnosticism. They, just, they kind of just don't care. They're like, eh, it's all right. She's like, there's, there's nothing for me to grab onto there. And so she's not able to effectively minister to them because there's, there's not really a passion there, so it's really hard to deal with an agnostic. Yeah, that's a good question. I'll have to think about that some more. Yeah. Rob? I had something happen in college that I'd love to get your take on. Great. Uh, a Christian roommate and I were at the Jester cafeteria having lunch with some hallmates who are vocal atheists, and my roommate was having a conversation with them about whether reality was subjective or objective. And so they're saying, okay, say there's a stack of four plates here, and you say there's only three, my roommate. Okay, fine, yeah, I say there's three plates, you say there's four, okay, cool. So my roommate said, what if I take this non-existent fourth plate and bash you across the head with it, would you feel it? <laughs> and the roommate, or the hallmate, the atheist said, but you wouldn't because it goes against your worldview. Uh -huh. <laughs> and we just didn't know what to say at that point. You know, it's like, okay, he's just playing with us. Yeah, that, and I think they really enjoy doing that, yeah. so. Um, or you think, like, how would you respond to that? Yeah. I mean, what do you say to something like that when, you know, so we're just... So well, he's just trying to be on. clever, right. I mean, we say, well, what if some complete jerk was sitting here who enjoyed hurting people, picked up that non-existent plate and hit you in the head with it, you know? So what would he say in that case, you know? Yeah, they, do, they try these kind of clever, quippy things to try... And see, this is... And I think this is... 
the advantage of the worldview challenge is that they'll come up with these kind of clever, ha-ha, funny ways to get out of these arguments to say, well, set up and defend your worldview. Explain to me how this works, yeah. right? Sure. You know, would you, would you trust a, a, if you're on top of a tall building and you need to get down, and I'm saying there's this invisible ladder there, would you take that invisible ladder to get down off the top of this building? You know, just yeah. things like that. Yeah, I kind of I get a lot of those sort of flippant answers sometimes, and to me they're they're just deflections. Yeah. Yeah. David. Could someone give him a mic? Because I'm just having a little bit of trouble here. Can you talk about your ministry, the six day science oh. ministry website, and also about your, the book that's back here that you have? Okay, yeah, I can talk about my ministry, my book. So, um, yeah, I still have my ministry. My website, which is spelled out sixdayscience.com, uh, I have not been active in maintaining that because I've been so busy working on other things, including this book that's back here, The Story of the Cosmos, uh, which was uh, it's an anthology. There's a bunch of really nifty essays in there. The idea was, um, the, one of the editors was really interested in Carl Sagan. I was raised with Carl Sagan, his cosmos, I still love it. And so the story of the cosmos was kind of a response to Carl Sagan's naturalistic view of the world and where these guys are saying, well, the story of the cosmos is actually God's story. And so he got these uh, scientists, philosophers, and there's even some people in the field of literature who draw on themes of astronomy in science and even, I think there's some stuff about um, Tolkien and C.S. Lewis in there. It's a really neat collection of science and literature and philosophy to talk about the story of the cosmos. And so my chapter is about God, black holes, and the end of the universe. And I really enjoyed writing this chapter because I was dealing with a, a problem I was having at the time, which is why does God seem so hidden? Why does God seem so absent so much of the time? You know, especially I've, those of you who've uh, you know, engaged with my story know that there was a period of time where I went through a lot of tragedy. I got cancer twice, we lost a child, my husband got deathly ill, and all of this happened in a really short space of time, and I went through a severe depression, and during that time, you know, I was getting almost angry with God. It's like, why don't you just speak to me? Why does it seem like you're so far away? And I encountered this essay, this response uh, from my friend Jim Wallace, Jay Warner Wallace, who wrote about God's hiddenness. I was like, that was it. And I understood that it wasn't out of a lack of caring. It wasn't out of cruelty. It was actually, there's a very loving, rational reason for this. And I combined that, believe it or not, with the science and the history of black holes. And I just, you know, it ended up being one of the most popular chapters in the book. People say they really love it. And so I encourage you to read it to find out how black holes can tell us about God's hiddenness. And it's a beautiful full color book. Um, so I'm, I've got a box of them back there and I'm quite happy to personalize those for anybody who would like them. Uh, and then, yeah, I've got a lot of stuff coming up. So I'd, uh, we were supposed to go on vacation, we canceled that. So I'm gonna be at this, um, what is it called, Life After Life? Yeah. Yeah, so I'll be engaging with that. Um, I also am going to be appearing in a movie next year. Uh, so I think most of you probably are acquainted with the Discovery Institute, Stephen Meyer. He's written a new book. And so uh, there was a film made about this book and I was interviewed for it. And so I'm gonna be in that. All kinds of things are, it's just like it's. Our little girl is so I know. <laughs> I know, it's just kind of crazy how this has happened. Also, I am featured in Lee Strobel's new book, uh, The Case for Heaven. He and I are friends on Twitter, which is just, this the only reason I like Twitter is it's kind of a hellscape, but I get to minister to so many people and I have been connected to so many people, including Lee Strobel, who interviewed me for his book, The Case for Heaven, because uh, he had heard about my story when we lost our daughter and how it was a vision that I had of her being taken up in the arms of God that really finally, because I was in a pretty bad way after this, like just, I don't even know how I can go on with life after this. And after I had that vision, you know, I, I just had like this renewed sense that I can get on with life. And so he wanted to talk to me about that for his book. And so you get to read about that. And I think it's coming out in just a couple of weeks. 
you know, Lee Strobel's great. All of his books are great, so I encourage you to get that. But yeah, all of this stuff is just kind of happening. And then um, I'm supposed to go to New York City to be on Eric Metaxas's show, um, I think it's uh, Socrates in the City. That's one where you have to actually be there in person. And so I'll be flying in there to do that and just all kinds of nifty stuff. So yeah, it, it just that's why I'll just keep coming back to this chapter, though, because you guys kind of gave me my start. You, this is where I launched, so I will always be a part of this group, and I will always, anytime you guys want me to do a lecture here, for sure, I will always do that. Yeah, okay. So I think that it probably looks like that's about it for questions, and I can stick around for a bit. Oh, did you have one more? Uh, well, I did. Go, going back to the question of multiverse, okay. uh, which, which I'm sure the absolute vast majority of people who quote it have no idea what it means. But has anybody ever challenged it on the basis of doesn't that just bump up the level of abstraction by one from, or, 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 or challenge it based on, say, Occam's razor? Yes, yes. So Occam's razor is a pretty good principle to argue against things like the multiverse. Um, this is the idea that all things being equal, the simplest explanation tends to be correct. Now, that's not something we can prove. Um, it's not something that, you know, in, in science we can't say, well, you know, I favor this explanation because of Occam's razor. But it's a, it's a pretty good guideline. But then also this idea of, of kicking the can, right? So what explains the Big Bang? Well, the multiverse. Okay, well, all you've done is just push the problem back one level. So what explains the multiverse? And the problem is that you really can't get away from the idea of a beginning so those of you who are interested in this kind of thing, there's a, a theorem called the board guth Lenkin theorem. And this was just developed a few years ago. And really, it shows, just in terms of the mathematics of cosmology, you can't get away from some kind of a definite beginning. Because even if you have a multiverse, any time you have a universe that's dynamic, that means it's changing over time. You have to have, mathematically they prove, you are stuck with the beginning. So a multiverse is certainly dynamic. It's not unchanging, things are happening with it, right? It's spawning new universes. They said, sorry, guess what? Even in a multiverse, eventually you're stuck with some kind of a beginning. And so this is where that Kalam cosmological argument comes in. Ultimately, you have to deal with the cause that is beyond whatever that physical scenario is. So yeah, that's a good point. They're just trying to push back the explanation. It is shocking to me how many people are willing to do that. It's like, I'm just gonna put this problem out of view and then I'm not gonna worry about it anymore. It's like, no, you can't do that. Somehow it solved the problem. Right. Solved the problem. <laughs> right, it's like my cats, you know, they think that, you know, if you can't see them and they can't see you, then you know, you're not really there. Or that, you know, it's just like, no, that's not how this works. So yeah, that, that's an excellent point. Don't let them kick the can. Yeah. All right, okay. thank you, sir. All right. Thank you very much.